Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to take in, isn't there? There's a, this is, and we're only scratching the surface, I assume. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's uh, tons to this there. I mean, uh, they even have a scripting engine uh, built into this there. So for features that aren't added to Firepower yet, you can um, script them out using ASA configuration. Yeah, it can be overwhelming. That's the only concern that I see with this. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's definitely a lot to this there, especially if you're uh, like a brand new CCNA or or uh, and you're just starting to look at, you know, you're into what an access list is in the CCNA and now you're saying like, okay, this is what we're really doing in the real world. Everyone back with Donald. Donald, you're a really busy guy. I'm amazed what you're doing. You and Todd recently wrote some new books. So what did you write about and what are we, what are we going to talk about today? Well, Todd and I, uh, we uh, finished writing our Firepower books um, last year and yep. got them properly published for volume one and volume two to cover everything you need to know about Firepower from a CCNP or CCIE perspective, which leads to that question you're probably going to ask, what is Firepower? Yeah, so let's uh, let's talk about Firepower because um, you, you deploy this. So you, you deploy this in the field, is that right? Oh, yeah, I deploy hundreds of Firepowers. So it's uh, sometimes a weekly activity for me. And I mean, one of the reasons I really like talking to you is that you, you know, in the field day in and day out, what we're doing is, you know, extra to your day job. So it's really good to get like real world hands-on experience and hopefully you can share a bunch of that uh, with the audience. So yeah, first question, what is what is Firepower? Yep, so uh, basically Cisco has a long history of firewalls. Back in the day, they used to have the picks if you're been in the game as long as David and I. That's right, yeah. And those were awful, awful little machines, but uh, they got the job done. Uh, but to be fair, all the firewalls back then were pretty awful. And then uh, eventually they evolved into the Cisco ASA, uh, which uh, did the network-based security. But uh, the downfall of the ASA uh, is that they never really had any inspection stuff there. It was more of a network-based firewall. So uh, Cisco eventually invented um, an IPS module that can do inspection, and it was god-awful. I don't know if you remember the IPS <laughs> module. Yeah, IDSs and IPSs. I remember, I remember working with those years ago, yeah. Yeah, uh, they were uh, they were painful if you uh, ever had to mess with that kind of stuff. But Cisco basically threw up their hands and said, "Hey, Snort's a pretty good company, so we're going to go ahead and buy them." Uh, which was um, who owns Snort again? It is. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, but anyway, Cisco bought them, and uh, they released uh, because Snort had an enterprise firewall. Eventually, that became uh, Firepower from Cisco, and they just renamed it to be Secure Firewall. And I hate that name. You mean, why, why do they call this a next generation firewall? Because you see that term bannered around a lot. Uh, basically, anytime you see next generation, what they mean is that uh, the IPS engine is uh, in the forefront and is doing inspection because uh, basically your old days of doing uh, an access list where you say, hey, I'm um, I'm going to allow port 80 and port 443. Well, now everything is in port 80 and 443. You want to be able to say, hey, I want to be able to lock Facebook or I want to... Be able to uh, have a deeper look at that packet to make sure that is that really FTP traffic or is that uh, some hacker trying to uh, get around your firewall or some guy trying to run BitTorrent and uh, download a movie on your network or something? So explain IPS because you for we want to make this as um, introductory as possible. What is IPS and how is that different to a traditional firewall? So an intrusion protection system is uh, basically what it does is it inspects the traffic and matches it based on um, application profiles, for, based on packet behavior and the payload and all that fun stuff. And so instead of just looking at an IP address and a port, we're looking at, hey, what is this behavior? And we can take that and say that we know what, say, the latest hack of the week is uh, and what it does to the payload. So we can uh, match that in the signatures and then we can um, block that traffic outright because we know that it's actually a hack or that's uh, something that we don't want to happen. So it's a more proactive uh, take on the network there was understanding what application is going through it, understanding what the traffic is hitting your network is and uh, making decisions based on that rather than this is it port 80 or not. So yeah, we can look into the packet and do so-called deep packet inspection and see the signature of the packet to see if it's like, like you mentioned, a valid FTP packet versus a malicious FTP packet. Is that right? Yeah. So I got to ask and you the nasty questions. Sorry, go on. I was going to ask you a nasty question, but what did you want to say? 
I was just going to say, in fact, uh, a lot of your time as a firewall engineer can be uh, fine-tuning the IPS there because sometimes, uh, while uh, uh, FTP, for example, might uh, be pretty well-known standard, but sometimes the person who made the FTP software is a little bit lazy or uh, they do things a little bit differently, and then uh, your IPS blocks your uh, corporate traffic because uh, it's not matching it there, so you have to adjust to say, okay, well, this is actually what this particular software is and you might have to make custom definitions and that kind of stuff. Nasty question. What, how does this compare to other vendors? Because a lot of people are going to say, look, there are other vendors in this game. How, what's your, and it's just, it's just your opinion, like in your personal capacity. What, what, what I mean, you frankly, I mean, uh, Cisco was in trouble back in the day when they had like their IPS module. Uh, basically, uh, when you had other vendors like uh, Palo Alto wasn't really around there, but when they were starting to come up, uh, uh, but you had your checkpoints and your other vet, Fortinet and whatnot there where they all had their IPS there and Cisco didn't really have a good one there. They were in trouble then. Now, uh, what Firepower is mature, it's went for quite a journey and uh, getting it integrated with the code. And uh, so now we have a nice consistent image before it was kind of like a Frankenstein monster if you ever did the early days of Firepower. Yeah, I've heard a lot of negative people or a lot of negative feedback about it. A lot of people complain in the past, but now it's, you're happy with it now. Yeah, uh, now it's pretty solid. Um, yeah. I, I quite like Firepower, uh, but the reason I like Firepower, for one, it's a good firewall, but two, uh, what makes Cisco hard to beat is their end-to-end -end, uh, solutions. So they uh, put a lot of effort into integrating their security pipelines. Your uh, Firepower can work with your Cisco ICE for your 8021X, and it can talk to your Cisco AMP, which is your malware, and it can talk to uh, your Stealth Watch, which is uh, your east-west uh, security for NetFlow or NetFlow-based security. And it can do all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, and it can pull that together using something called PX Grid which will um, uh, let everything act in unison there. Because uh, one of the big problems of the industry is, uh, let's just say Palo Alto, uh, maybe uh, you like them better for a firewall, but you know they don't really make network switches. They don't really do anything else there. So uh, they have a product that they're fairly good at. I mean, I'll give them credit, uh, but uh, they uh, they don't have other solutions there. So what you have to do is you have to buy you know best uh, one product, one product, one product. And then you got to figure out how to glue them together. Yeah. Whereas someone like uh, Cisco and to a lesser degree Fortinet, uh, they have more end to end stories where they have every little product there where they can integrate in and they can tell the whole story where. That's where you get things like the SecureX platform that Cisco just released last year, where it pulls all that information to one dashboard so your security teams can uh, look at a nice clean dashboard and do automation, all that fun stuff. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I mean, I, I think we should, so just to open up to the audience, if you've got any questions based on this discussion that Donald and I are having, please put in the comments below. So if you want another video about SecureX or something else, again, what I really like about talking with Donald, you know, why I like talking to Donald about this stuff is number one, he's got a lot of experience and he does this day to day. And Donald, you don't just do Cisco, yeah, you work charming. with other vendors. Sorry, you're pretty charming, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's like you you do a lot of other, you do other vendors as well. I mean, it's not just- Oh yeah, just I basically work with everyone. Yeah. So, I mean, you've got, a, you've got a lot of experience, wide experience and a whole bunch of products. But I mean, that's why, you know, for us to listen to your personal opinion about why this is a good product, I think is, is a good thing to know. So do you want to say anything more about that or can you do a demo and show us how to set this up? Uh, yeah. So what are, what are we looking at? Is this, uh, what, do, what do we see, Amalia? So this is Cisco's um, emulation uh, system like GNS3 or even G allows you to host a whole bunch of stuff, yeah? Yep. I wanted to ask you, you, you and I had a discussion sort of in the chat on, a, on another video, CML, you've got it to run multi-vendor stuff, is that right? Yep, so if you look here, you can see I'm running uh, Ford in that, I have F5 here, Juniper, um, uh, I have uh, all kinds of random stuff in my lab there. I, I quite <laughs> like CML's uh, automation platform. It's great, so let's sh show us how to set up uh, uh, Firepower. Sorry, I don't wanna keep going off on tangents. Okay, no, fair enough. Uh, so inside my CML, which is my preferred tool for labbing for the most part, Speaking of multi-vendors, you can see I have all kinds of stuff here. But I have created a FTD instance, which is the uh, Firepower Threat Defense. That's what we get when we uh, want to run it. And essentially all I've done is just uh, define the memory uh, and then 
pick the interfaces. Uh, when you're doing Firepower, um, the first interface is the management interface. And the second interface is called diagnostic there. And how to think of that is that um, the management is the outside of the management interface and the diagnostic is the inside of the diagnostic interface there. So they can have two different IP addresses. So this would be more of your out of band and this would be like your in-band management for like sending out traffic uh, to your ICE server or any kind of uh, SNMP traps, that kind of thing. How did you get the image? Do you, do you, can you just download that from Cisco? Does it come with CML? How do you get the software to run it? So if we go to software and we search for Firepower, we have uh, in here uh, a couple of tools, but the one we want is threat defense. And we can see that right now, the latest version is 701 and the 71 beta just wrapped up there. So I'll be out in a week or two. Uh, but what you would do is you can download the KVM image for GNS3 or uh, CML or whatever you want to do. And this is what you would use. And then you just add this directly. You don't need to convert it or anything. It's just ready to go. Yeah, you, this is not freely available to anyone. You need to have um, an agreement with Cisco, yeah? Uh, yeah? If you do want to play with this on your own, you can take advantage of the cloud. So you can log into your AWS or your Azure and uh, spin up instances with that. I think we, sh we should do that in a separate video, show us how to do that. Anyway, back to CML. Uh, the only other interesting thing is that um, I set the uh, boot parameter there. So it basically waits to us use the logon prompt so it knows that it's ready. And then what I do here is I've set up uh, what's called Cloud Init. And what this does is it will automatically configure my uh, FTDs so that it's going to give it a host name, uh, the my lab password. Uh, please don't hack me, David. <laughs> and then um, give it the IP addresses uh, for what's in my environment. And then the other thing here is that I am telling it to register to a management center. And because with Firepower, we can manage it either through uh, a management center, we can manage it through the cloud with something called Cisco Defense Orchestrator, or we can have it run in standalone mode there where we uh, do it for the web GUI, but there's no CLI in this. Uh, everything is done through uh, the web and or automation with Firepower. So in other words, it's not like ASA or or picks showing our age where you can log in through the CLI or router. Everything's through GUI. Yeah, you're not doing comp T and typing your interfaces and your access list anymore there. They're uh, doing it all through the... Um, do, you, do you have to put that stuff in that you... FTDs, that you have to put that in? Or is that something you can just uh, ignore? You don't. Uh, this is just uh, because I'm an automation guy. This is just going to do this. There. If I don't do this, it's just going to ask us... Um, uh, to do the setup and uh, it's going to ask us what the IP address is and that kind of thing. So after this um, call, could you, or we'll keep asking you to do things, could you put this on your FTP, sorry, on your um, your GitHub, like you did with the automation stuff and just take out your password just so that people have got like a template they can, can download? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll just export this and uh, we can put it on there. That's no problem. Great. There's nothing fancy there. All right. So anyway, that's uh, the main gist of it. So what we're going to do is just add a lab and we'll call this uh, David FTD lab. So you keep using the term FTD. Um, can you just give us uh, the definition? Firepower threat defense is what they call the actual product now. Okay. All they called it, now it's a secure firewall. Yeah, that's a secure firewall until you hacked, yeah? Yeah, there's uh, asking for trouble with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I do have an FTD lab, but it's a little bit more terrifying if you've never seen it before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we can come back to that later. Man, what are you running this on? Is it on an ESXi server or something? Yeah, ESXi. Yeah. I got a really big cluster that um, I run all the stuff on. What we'll do is we're going to need an external connector. And that just connects us to the internet, yeah? Yep. Yeah. And it's just so we can manage things. So we're just going to call this bridge. And we're going to make this a bridge adapter. So basically, it's either going to be a NAT address or it's going to be put on my LAN. So this will allow you to open up a web browser on your PC and connect through uh, like a Chrome or something directly to the Firepower, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Or more importantly, it's going to let our, our management center um, connect to the uh, Firepower. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add an unmanaged switch. 
Yeah, we're just going to say that this is management. I'm going to add a bunch of interfaces. And then we're going to actually add our FTD node, which is somewhere in here. There we go. So what we're going to do is just call this uh, DC1 FTD01. Go ahead and yeah, we'll just do two for. Yeah, we'll do four. So you're basically creating duplicate uh, firepowers, yeah? Yeah, we're just uh, adding the nodes there, just like with GNS3 or whatever tool of your choice. So we're just making what we want. So now that we have this, what we're going to do is just connect our management interfaces and also our diagnostic. So now we have our management there. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and add, let's just say a switch. And we will clone it. By the way, it's good to have a nice naming convention in your head when you do this kind of stuff there. So you can say like, hey, it's uh, this site and this name kind of thing there, just so you're not uh, going to the drawing board every time you drag something. Yeah. Do is we will go ahead and add a LAN interface. So we'll say that this is like so. And then one more thing we'll do is just add an internet connection. We will connect this to a router. And then we're just going to add another unmanaged switch. By the way, people don't know the unmanaged switch is just a dumb switch, just like in GNS3 that has no configuration. So it's just providing more ports for us. On it. I'd like to max out the interfaces in case I get some inspiration later. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, CML's, CML's got a lot better than it was a while ago. Yeah, it's uh, they definitely put some effort into it for sure. Uh, but uh, they got some ways to go too. But uh, it's uh, there's definitely more progress than uh, viral was before it died. Yeah. So you've got like a gigabit zero zero on those file powers connected to the internet, and then you've got like gigabit zero one connecting to the internal network, is that right? Yep. And then you've got your management going to the um, that other cloud? Yep, that should more or less do it. Let's just add some desktops. Later. And we'll connect this to one slash zero. Much later. Uh, so um, this is what I threw together for our lab, David. Yep. So uh, what we have here is a little bit messy, but uh, if you uh, we got lost in the weeds while throwing this together, we have our FTDs. We have four of them, and then we have them connected to the management network uh, using the uh, management and the diagnostic interfaces. Yep. Then. We have on gig zero, it is connecting to the internet, which is going to let them uh, be uh, access the internet like Google or whatnot when we get, probably not today, but deeper in the labs. We also have 
a Cisco switch that is going to be connected with gig zero one. And this is going to have a simple lap there. So if we get far enough, we can um, uh, do some basic things and generate some logs and make some access rules. And that's uh, basically what we're doing there. And one last thing I'm going to do, because we're going to run these as a failover, is I'm going to connect the last two interfaces so that we can uh, treat this as a single firewall. So that's the boring cabling stuff out of the way, or maybe exciting cabling stuff. Uh, some people like this. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of sound like to for a lab together. Uh, all right. So then the last thing we need to do before we start this lab is uh, remember I'm using the cloud init to um, uh, speed this along. So what I'm going to do is just change the IP address so it suits my lab. So I'm going to say that this is 91 and leave everything else the same. And then I also forgot to update the host names here. So we'll say this is two. Much, much later. All right, so with all that in place, we should be able to go ahead and start this lab. Now this is gonna take a while to actually run through and do the actual setup there. So what we'll do is we'll turn our attention over to the management center and just start talking about that for a bit. So is this a virtual machine that you're running um, somewhere that has access to the device, yeah? Yeah, to the this lab. is actually, um, I, we can take a step back actually. So, so my virtual management station, I'm just running as a virtual machine inside a VMware workstation. And again, you would download this from Cisco, assuming you have rights there, or you can play with the cloud, which we'll talk about uh, later on. But if you look here, this will be, um, Fairly simple virtual machine. It takes a fair amount of resources to run all the things. And this is sort of Cisco's management platform for firewalls and, and the like, yeah? Exactly. Because remember, there's no CLI for, um, there's no CLI available for the uh, FTD. There's basic like diagnostic troubleshooting stuff, but you can't actually configure an IP address or anything like that. It's a lot like uh, Checkpoint, actually, if you ever use that product, because um, you can push the firewall configuration, but the um, they started adding um, some basic CLI stuff uh, very recently, and Cisco's kind of probably going to start adding more and more CLI when they get around to it. What we have here is we're basically running 32 gigs of RAM to uh, run my FMC. You, if you're doing it in a lab, you can do probably about 16 uh, comfortably. Um, you don't want to go... If you go lower than 16, then some of the features won't work very well. So, uh, but if it's lab, it might be good enough for you. And then I'm giving it four processors. So you've just imported a, a VM, you bridged it to your local network so that you can yeah, access the CML uh, lab. Yep. Yeah. And you, do you need this? Or did you say you can just connect directly to the firewalls using a web browser? You can, uh, you can choose to do it in a standalone mode, uh, which they call the Firepower, um, Firepower uh, Device Manager, FDM. Yeah, and um, that will let you uh, configure things independently. And there's also a cloud option, which we can talk about next time there, which uh, lets you essentially manage um, your firepower, uh, kind of like a Meraki. So uh, they do have a couple options there, but uh, the FMC is the most common. So when you're deploying this to clients, you, you're going to use the FMC on, in, the, in most cases, yeah? Yeah, almost always the FMC, unless um, unless like they're very small, they just need a basic firewall. But uh, the FMC is uh, gives you a lot of functionality that uh, they're starting to bring more into the standalone there. But uh, for a while there, if you wanted things like um, dynamic routing, whatnot, you needed to use the FMC, but they started porting that over. So this is FMC. This is actually running in um, dark mode because dark is cool. If you want, you can... Uh, flip this back and forth to um, light mode and uh, classic if you want to burn your eyes out. <laughs> but uh, we'll just keep this, uh, well, we'll keep it on light mode for now for a little change. So inside of here, uh, the first thing it's going to do is just have you register to the smart licensing. But uh, aside from that, this is what you'll see. Now I already, this is my lab FMC. So I have a bunch of stuff in here already. So we can see here, I've added a bunch of different FMCs as well as testing various things over 
the lifespan of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create a group just to keep this organized. And we're just going to call this David DC1. All right. And we'll also create a group for DC2. So the idea here is when our firepower is ready, and uh, we might have to kill some time here, David, for the firewalls to be ready. But um, once the firewalls are ready, we can get them added to the system and then we can start working on our policies. But what I'll do is just switch over to the policy side. So if we look here, if you ever configured an ASA before, you have your access list and then um, that's basically all you would apply there. And then uh, there's a couple other features you might turn on depending on what's necessary for you. But in here, we have a bunch of options. So we have access control. This is basically the same as your ACL. Your intrusion um, policy is the IPS that we're talking about. It can also do uh, file inspection to see if there's any malware inside your Word document or whatever else uh, kind of document you have. Uh, DNS, it can go ahead and block uh, bad DNS uh, entries there because this will talk to something called Cisco Talos, which is uh, Cisco's uh, security research um, division there. And when they identify a particular bad domain or whatnot, that gets updated uh, as part of the security cloud um, that uh, Cisco operates. And they once they learn that of a threat there, they advertise that to basically everyone. So it's kind of a Borg-like protection. Then we have identity, which is used for um, if we want to correlate. So we can say that, hey, uh, we want David, uh, uh, David, the user, to be allowed in a policy rather than David's IP address. We can do SSL decryption because most things are in... Uh, SSL these days, we can't just um, have uh, ignore the SSL because uh, otherwise um, we could be missing out on a bunch of inspection. And pre-filter, something we'll talk about later, but this is uh, just a way of bypassing some of the inspection for some, certain traffic. Which ones do you which ones are you using in the real world? Is it like all of those, or is it just really uh, depend all on them? Yeah. Um, the only ones that are optional is sometimes you don't do SSL uh, because it's um, just not worth it for the deployment. So SSL is where it's like basically proxying the, the certificates, is that right? Yeah, exactly. And sometimes you don't do identity because uh, you might not uh, want to go for the effort of uh, doing the integration of Active Directory for rules. So you might just do a basic rule set. Pretty much all of them will be used. Um, Malware and file is also a bit optional. Uh, that's more for um, if you're doing more internet-based inspection like outbound and you want to make sure that uh, people's files and attachments and emails and stuff are looking all right. So we're looking at access control policy now, yeah? Yep, so this is access control policy. And what we can do here is nest our groups. So what I do is I typically create something like global. So this is going to apply to all my firewalls. And then I'll have a dependency layer or uh, another rule base there that's um, inherits all the rules. And this is going to be for my VPN based traffic. And then my inbound traffic is uh, going to be things like things I do NATs for. And then my outbound is going to be based on what the actual um, data center is. So if I create a new rule, I could call this outbound David DC1. Then for my base policy, I'm going to go ahead and say that it's part of this there. So basically, uh, most of my outbound traffic is where the differences is. Everything else should be more or less the same in this policy. If I wanted to have um, a single policy, I could do that there, but I like to try and be organized. And then we can add the group. So when I add the device there, when it's ready, then it's going to automatically apply this policy when we're good to go. So basically, you're deciding which traffic is allowed out, which traffic is allowed in. Is that right? Yep. So the next page is where we actually make our rules. And this will look a lot different if you're used to today, say, because usually you type like access list, permit, uh, whatever, and then do there. And this is more of a nice, pretty GUI. I can categorize this as I want to there. So I can add categories to for things to make sense there. We can say uh, lab fun. So we can organize this however it makes sense to our company. Or, uh, or network, and then I can add rules to it. And here is where we can uh, start defining things there. So, and there's a couple different ways we can handle this depending on what your design philosophy is. The simplest thing to do is we still have our zones and access list there. So when we get to our interfaces, we'll uh, define them to zones there so that we do zone-based protection rather than um, just uh, relying on IP addresses. So I could go ahead and say, if I want things from the inside network, which we'll talk about when we're ready, and we go to the outside network, then basically all the traffic is going to be permitted from this thing. We'll give this a name. We'll just call this inside to outside works. 
And we can see that we can allow traffic, we can trust traffic, which basically means that we're uh, not gonna bother inspecting, we're just gonna let it through. We can monitor the traffic, which means that we're gonna let whatever happens gonna happen, but we're not actually gonna block it. So this is useful if you wanna do a lab where you, you're evaluating firepower and just wanna see what firepower would do, but you don't wanna block traffic. You can also block, which is what firewalls do. You can block with a reset, because um, when you're doing uh, firewalls there, you might not want to just reset the connection right away there because uh, that will let your tools like Nmap know that, hey, something reacted to this traffic there. So uh, there might be worth looking at. Whereas if you just do a block, it's just going to time out like nothing's there. We can also do an interactive block. This is where we can um, have like a message pop up on a person's screen and say like, hey, you're not allowed to go to this website or that kind of thing. And interactive block with reset. So basically the same thing. It's just going to kill the traffic too. So we're just going to say allow for the networks we can do uh one or two things we can just leave it open and rely on our zones for protection or we can drill down to particular networks now there's a bit of a design philosophy here where um, the old school kind of thinking is that you would put the networks as much as possible just like the old firewalls so you'll say like, hey, we'll create a network for the uh, what this firewall is going to have, and we're only going to allow that. Because of the next generation with the IPS uh, side of things there, we might not want to go for that. We might just say that anything going through the zone, we're just going to go ahead and uh, let the role work. And I've seen some firewalls where they don't even bother doing zones. They basically just say, hey, and if everything's allowed unless the IPS says no. It really depends on how big your firewall is and what your philosophy is. There's... Not really a wrong answer necessarily, but for our sakes, we can go ahead and say, we're going to say only private IPs are allowed. So, any, so in other words, only private from the inside, which is your corporate network going to the internet, yeah? If I wanted to, I could go ahead and add a network. So I could say, uh, David DC1 LAN. Uh, let's say, I don't know, 192.168. 91.0. So we can create a network if we want to lock this down. And then I'll just go ahead and add this in. I can add as many as I make sense to me. It's going to leave this uh, nice and generic for right now. We'll talk about it in more detail later if we get around to it. But we can also do geolocation blocking. I don't know if you ever watch CNN there, but apparently Russia is a naughty country sometimes. <laughs> so um, what we can do is we can go ahead and um, block uh, whatever countries um, we feel that uh, we don't actually do business with. Like, so for example, if your country or your country, your uh, business um, doesn't actually ever work with Vietnam, there's just no possibility that they're a legitimate customer for you, then um, you can just go ahead and say, hey, we're going to go ahead and block traffic from Vietnam because uh, we're just not going to waste the effort or let's say China. Uh, you can, by lowering your footprint of what countries you're actually going to deal with there, you're going to have a much better attack for, or a much smaller attack footprint there because you don't need to worry about uh, dealing with all the random countries. Now, if you're in a multinational business there, this might not be practical because uh, if you uh, you can't just block, uh, say, Canada there, if uh, Canada could be a legitimate um, e-commerce for you. But uh, it is a good practice to try and filter what is um, low-hanging fruit there, and it's just going to help you. Now, hackers can still spoof their IPs and stuff, but it just makes it a little bit harder for the uh, script kiddies to hit you. But anyway, uh, that's the networks. Uh, VLAN tags, uh, you don't really use this too much there, but what you can do is you can inspect the packet for um, if there's particular uh, VLAN headers in it. Um, this is more for advanced features. Uh, I typically don't see this used too much, but it is there if you want to get really granular with what kind of traffic's allowed. Users, so I've already added my Active Directory to this um, FMC. But what I could do here is I can go ahead and say, hey, domain users are allowed which means that um, if I'm not logged into my active directory, it's going to go ahead and identify me. And if it uh, can identify me, then it's just going to not uh, match this rule. So if I want to say that David is allowed to go to, uh, I don't know, Reddit, then uh, we can make an exception and because David is a very important person there, but uh, everyone else <laughs> is not allowed to go there. So uh, the, uh, what this typically manifest as there is, is really hard to tell an executive no. So uh, because uh, ultimately they pay for all these fancy solutions there. And if uh, they want to go to Facebook, you can't really stop them. So, uh, or sometimes it's necessary for their job, their marketing or that kind of thing where um, uh, you, uh, you'll you make uh, 
basically what's called a whitelist. And you'll basically say that these particular websites are allowed and these particular users are allowed to go there. It's just going to let you have more um, granular rule sets to say that certain people who are allowed to access uh, certain resources are allowed to and everyone else isn't allowed or vice versa. In your experience, what do you find is the most typical thing that you deploy? Is it based on like, um, do you actually go that granular in a lot of organizations? Not necessarily. When we get to URLs, you can see some of the uh, categories we can do. Like, uh, for example, adult is usually um, pretty universally uh, blocked because uh, there's uh, only a few instances that um, you would have to do that. I actually did I used to work for a job where I did have to do that there because I had to uh, make sure all the uh, pay per views were working uh, and ISP, and that meant uh, even the naughty ones. So uh, it was a very interesting work experience when I had to do that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you can see there's a bunch of categories there that are pretty standardized. So like uh, malicious sites is pretty self-explanatory. You might say that, hey, look, you don't need to look at uh, swimsuit stuff or uh, illegal stuff might be blocked. So there's a pretty... There's usually pretty universal stuff there where you can block there, like, uh, you know, crypto mining, uh, weed uh, might not be worth uh, talking about in the business. Uh, So you can get uh, pretty flexible. And then um, for the applications, they do this based on uh, ratings. So we can see here that um, we can do it based on risk there. So we might just say if it's a high risk application, uh, we can go ahead and say, okay, look, uh, we don't need to allow BitTorrent or that kind of stuff there unless you have a very particular reason. So we can see there, like uh, inside here, we have uh, Adult Friend Finder, which is uh, a naughty site. We've got a bunch of BitTorrent stuff, uh, basically uh, file transfers, uh, malicious sites. So this is kind of no brainer stuff that you can usually block. And then if there's uh, exceptions need to do, you can whitelist. So tell me, I mean, th- th- there's a lot of options here and that leads to the question, if I'm starting, I could make a lot of mistakes. Is there like a standard, like sort of template that you would use or can get somewhere? Or is it really, you just have to go through all of these options and decide? Uh, there are some best practices, like Cisco re- uh, releases regular design docs for a lot of the products there where they can offer them there. But a lot of this is, um, uh, you have to just figure out on your own there because every business has different priorities. Like uh, I might just say, hey, just block high and very high and walk away there. And then your IT will say, hey, we can't SSH anywhere or that kind of thing, right? So uh, you uh, you do have to, uh, for any security product, doesn't matter if it's Cisco or whatnot there, you always have to uh, uh, validate and uh, communicate with the business and figure out what makes sense. So I just saw something there as you were going through the options, a VPN company, can this block people using... Tor or some of the VPN, you know, like NordVPN or some of these companies, or um, is that a way that a user just bypass all of this? Yeah, like there's Tor. So uh, uh, this can identify Tor traffic there and it can go ahead and block it for you or do whatever you want to do. You can, uh, like if I wanted to, I could say add Tor there. And then of course I would say that I want to block it instead. I have to change my name and stuff though. It makes more sense. But uh, yeah, so let's actually do this. Let's, uh, let's do a more practical example. So uh, we're just going to go ahead and jump to, we'll talk about dynamic attributes in a little bit, but this is where you can query things like um, uh, you can get information from other security products or you can query, uh, I have uh, set up dynamic uh, query here so it can get uh, the IP addresses that Azure uses and uh, Office 365, that kind of stuff. So we can uh, have it uh, intelligently figure out what the IP address is for your cloud services use. But we'll just go inspection and we'll just go IPS policy. I'll just leave that there. There's a variable set that um, we can uh, define there to make this more efficient where we tell what the IP addresses is. We'll come back to that. And for file policy, we'll just go ahead and say, we'll do file policy and we'll say, so this is our generic rule. And we add this. This basically can say everything from inside to outside is allowed. So what we can do is just add a rule above it. So it has the same kind of ideas like a traditional access list where something above it will be denied and then everything will be permitted by the last rule type thing, yeah? Yeah, exactly. So we'll just go add new rule, and we're going to say that this is above rule one, and we're going to say block four. So we can go ahead and say inside to outside. We're going to say that this is a block, and we're going to find this four we're talking about, right? Four, yeah. Just as an example of an application, because guys might try and, you know, users might try and, to convent the firewall. Yeah, so let's just say we're going to block Tor, and 
I didn't talk about ports there, but if you want to do generic ports, you can still uh, do arbitrary ports here. Um, it is a good idea to do application and ports there, so it's more efficient. If you do application, it's going to rely on the IPS and it's going to allow uh, whatever the when the application is defined there. But if you have standard applications, you might also want to add um, uh, the ports here so that uh, it's more locked down. But it's more of a design philosophy. Uh, we can we don't need to do inspection because we're blocking it. We're going to make sure we're logging this. Uh, by the way, you can do time ranges. So you can say that you're not allowed to do tour during business hours. And afterwards, we don't care. Not sure why you would do that. You can also add comments if you want. So I can say demoing to David. And we can go add. So yeah, you could have created a rule called like block VPNs and then you would block like Tor or, you know, all these VPN companies. It's really up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to say into category lab plot. There. And you can actually drag and drop these. So I can move this around as I need to. So now, um, just to finish this up, if so, we have our, we're allowing everything except for Tor. And if it turns out that someone really needs Tor for whatever reason, we can say, allow David to use Tor. And what we'll do here is we'll pick a user. Pretty sure I don't actually have a David account, but let's just say... Yeah, you can just be someone. You can be Keith Parker. How's that? Okay. All right. So now what we'll do, as you might guess, is we'll say Tor. And we'll do our full inspection. And we'll just say log at the beginning. Yeah, so Keith could go to Tor, but I wouldn't, or no one, no other users would, even though, you know, there's a mismatch with our name, but yeah, same concept. Yeah, yeah, I should tend to call it key, but whatever. Uh, so uh, basically we build out the rule as we need to, and we can see there that uh, because I've nested rules, so we can see that I don't actually have any global rules, I don't know if I have any. Okay, I have some VPN rules. Yeah. So uh, you can see that this builds the actual policy. And when we're done, we would push this because no, uh, the other change from the ASA is that nothing is done until you actually deploy the firewalls. Uh, so you can spend all day working on your rules and make sure they're perfect and then push it rather than type a command and it's instantly applied. So there's pros to that and there's cons to that because uh, sometimes you need something done really quickly and sometimes uh, uh, it's better to plan things out there. Just either one has their pros and cons, uh, but uh, generally speaking, this is the best way to handle firewalls is um, you, you can make sure everything's in place before you actually hit the button. Speaking so, of in place. So you've only done outbound. You haven't done inbound yet. Is that right? So you outbound is like users inside your network getting to the internet. We haven't done like internet traffic into the network. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't done that yet. Uh, but while we're here, so that's the basic rule base that we talked about. Uh, you can also do things like you can see if there's any conflicting rules. Uh, which were pretty simple right now. We can um, also do things like, uh, actually before I leave here, you can do things like uh, filter for particular rules because you can have like rule bases with hundreds of rules if you're uh, busy there. So you can figure out what you want to find. So if I want to search for David, you can see that we can use that to find rules. Uh, we can uh, mess with the inheritance settings. So if I don't want to be bound by the structure anymore, I can remove this by clicking there. Hit counts. We don't actually have firewalls yet, but uh, when we do, we can figure out how um, often the rule is used. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of how Cisco implemented this, to be honest. Um, I prefer the checkpoint way where it's more dynamic. This is more, uh, you pick the device and it queries it rather than being more of a real-time monitor, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, other tabs, we have their security intelligence. So this is where it relies on the Talos. So we can see here that uh, because I'm inheriting from the global, uh, none of this is set and we can have a look at it. So what we're going to do is just get out of here and we're going to go to global because this is our base policy. And this is where we apply all the features to it. So you can see I don't actually have any rules. If I had something that's universal, like uh, block David everywhere or something like that, I could do that there and just gonna all the firewalls in this policy are gonna get that rule. But if I wanted to adjust things like um, the security intelligence, I could go ahead and say, hey, look, uh, I don't want any sites that have malware or phishing or any of these bad security things. So what I can do is just select them. And we can just say, we're gonna go ahead and block any instance of uh, 
these security issues. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the paradigm is very different to the old days. In the old days, you had to manually come up with all these crazy rules. Here, you, you basically oh, yeah. use well, it. Have you ever tried doing geolocation before? It was a yeah. nice list where you just pick a country. Uh, you used to have like an alcohol of like uh, 30,000 IP address or networks in it sometimes. It's, uh... Yeah, it was insane. So here, it's like using the cloud and a central repository of, of knowledge to, by just clicking that, you've, you've blocked Bogan and a whole bunch of other dodgy websites in one go. So I can do that by network or URL. Uh, I typically like to do both there. Typically, there's never any conflicts with doing this kind of stuff there because there's uh, the only way that you'll be flagged as a CNC is if it's uh, an incorrect thing there, and that's something that you can work out. But uh, usually, this stuff is pretty safe to just block on any policy. Uh, HTTP responses, uh, we'll talk about this another day, but this is where we do like the SSL decryption, and uh, we can push a website there say like, hey, you're not allowed to. So let us look at the system provider one. So this is basically where it gives us uh, HTTP and we can write a little response saying like, hey, uh, this is a forbidden site, you can't go here. And um, this isn't as nice as um, like the Cisco uh, W or web security appliance. Like uh, this is more bare bones because Cisco is not trying to cut off their nose despite their face there. They don't want to make firepower the perfect replacement for WSA and then no one buys WSA anymore. They're, they're kind of doing the Microsoft thing there where they have a decent solution there, but they're not trying to displace other things like WebSense or anything like that. Uh, logging. So you can push this to things like Splunk or whatnot. If you want to, you can have all the or solo wins or whatever is doing your monitoring. You can send traps. Then advance. There's a ton of options here, which are Todd's and I's books will cover a lot of it there, but this is where we can really drill down into how particular traffic is um, handled. So with that done, we'll just go ahead and go save. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting, you've done all of this through a management application, and this is just running in the management top application. It's not deployed to the fire power devices at all yet. Yeah, that's why we have this little uh, deploy button here. So when we do that, when we're ready, we can push it there. So uh, this is uh, nice because you can get everything ready and schedule a change and just push it at that time. You don't have to worry about accidentally locking yourself out of your router because you messed up your access list. You can still lock yourself out if you push a bad access list and deploy it, but that's kind of on you at that point. Yeah. But uh, so that is the basic policies. Intrusion, there's not a lot to show you here, but what this does is um, ICE or ICE, uh, Firepower will be constantly um, evaluating all the traffic that goes through your network. And what it's going to do is it's going to try and figure out, hey, what web service is guy running and what operating system? And it's going to do all that to figure out what it's calling the... Um, uh, Snort Free version. Uh, what it's going to be doing is trying to map all the uh, endpoints there and all the um, what uh, software they're running, what operating system, and it's going to figure out what is vulnerable there. So if it knows that, say, IIS 6 is uh, insecure, it's going to go ahead and figure out hey, this web server is running that there and it's going to flag it and it's going to add to something called an indication of uh, compromise, indicator of compromise art. But what you do here is and just like with any firewall product, you can go through and figure out which rules are better suited for um, your environment. Uh, Todd and I tend to recommend doing security over connectivity there because uh, the balanced uh, default rule is a little bit too permissive. But what you can do here is if someone calls you and says, hey, I can't access, uh, I said IAS or this was a search file. If uh, they say the web server is not working anymore, you might make... Um, a whitelist for that server, or you might say that rule is too restrictive there and we're going to adjust it. So this is where we'll do some fine tuning and figure out what is um, uh, what makes sense to your environment there. And that's where Firepower is really good at identifying what is in your network. So you can see here that this is a command and control for ASPX. So this is usually pretty safe to block. Oh, here's one. Here's a... Okay, so here is a IS range header. So if we want to, we can read about this. It'll give you plenty of information about what this is. It'll give you the actual snort rule. You can read um, information about what this actually does there from security sites. So you can research if this makes sense to you. You can uh, get references, all that kind of stuff. But if we wanted to say that, you know, we need this, we can say, okay, I'm going to allow this. I'm going to uh, rewrite the rule and uh, change things around, but you can uh, control how each rule is done. And if we look at recommendations, 
what this is going to do is it is going to generate the recommended rules based on what it sees on my network. So for example, if I only use Linux, oh, fair enough, I need to apply to something, but um, only use like uh, Linux uh, for web there, then it does make sense to enable the Microsoft stuff. So uh, it'll go ahead and not turn that stuff on there so we have better performance. But that is all we need to know for intrusion. The malware stuff is basically what it will do is it will set on um, the file to be inspected in a sandbox. So what we can do here is we can go create and we can say that, hey, I want to do office documents, for example. And we can say that we want to block files entirely. So we just don't want that on our network. That's usually not good for your job if you want to block all uh, office um, <laughs> files. So that's probably a <laughs> risk <Really>? generating event. <laughs> um, yeah, career limiting event that, yeah, for yeah sure. But if you want to do a look up there to see if there's a uh, uh, basically, what it'll do is it'll take the SHA off the file and um, run it against the cloud there to see if uh, that has any issues. And if it does, then it'll go ahead and block it. Or we could just go ahead and say, hey, we want to do inspection. And uh, this is basically going to use the full uh, Cisco AMP engine to, uh, uh, I guess, a secure endpoint now. But it's going to go ahead and submit that stuff there because the firewall actually has your full file in the buffer when it's uh, all the traffic's running through it there. So it can pass it along and get some information. You can also store files there if you have enough uh, information on your um, or not, uh, storage on your firewall. This is usually good to block like or store the malware stuff there so that uh, or the unknown there just in case it needs to do more forensics. Uh, clean, you probably don't want to store there because there's probably no reason to, but you can customize the policy as much as you need to there. And usually this is the kind of thing you just want to test out in the lab and uh, make sure you're not blocking anything there. But you can say that, hey, I want to do this for web traffic, email, uh, FTP we talked about earlier, or net files. So we can uh, do this uh, based on the direction. And we can say if this uploads, downloads. So uh, you have pretty good ground of control. Yeah, it can be overwhelming. That's the only concern that I see with this. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's definitely a lot to this there, especially if you're uh, like a brand new CCNA or, or uh, and you're just starting to look at, you know, you're into what an access list is in the CCNA and now you're, Saying like, okay, this is what we're really doing in the real world. Uh, identity stuff, um, I'll show you what it looks like. We're here. Yes, if they bought your books, the books that you and Todd wrote, that would give whoever wanted to learn Firepower a good foundation, yeah? Oh, yeah. They would know probably a lot more than they ever cared to know. Because those books are written for the certs, are they? Uh, yeah, it's basically uh, a CCI level approach. So it's, uh, it goes really into the weeds uh, because um, the uh, CCMP um, and the uh, CCIE is a bit more of a different relationship now where we don't have the CCI written anymore. We have the uh, core exams. So uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we're uh, covering all the bases there. Well, for inspection, what we can do is passive uh authentication or active. Uh, so passive means that it's just going to watch uh, the domain controller for login information and try and figure out who you are uh, without uh, bugging you. Active means that it's going to uh, force you, uh, kind of like when you log into a guest network on wireless, it props up a guest portal yeah. and uh, you have to register. So the same kind of idea here is going to pop up and say, okay, who are you, David? Well, it won't, it won't say, who are you, David? It'll say, who are you? And you have to say, David, but um, yeah. And then you'll have to uh, enter in your thing there. And once it knows who you are, then it's going to consider you authenticated. So this works usually pretty well. Uh, passive is what I generally recommend uh, because typically you don't want to hassle users unless uh, there's a reason for it. Yeah, the problem is the problem is if you're too strict, then they're going to complain and they're going to try and find ways around it. You don't want to go too crazy. Uh, one cool feature we won't get too much into today is correlation. And what this does is it takes the fact that the FMC sees a lot of information. What you can do is you can actually create rules that say that, hey, if uh, this particular condition is happening, we want to do something about it there. So if someone's doing, say, a port scan or um, you're seeing all these kind of rules, then you can go ahead and make these complicated um, rule sets. So you can say like, hey, if a malware event occurs, then we're going to go ahead and... Uh, do something about it. We can see that it builds out the logic as we go. So we can say, hey, if there's a condition, we're going to do this there. And this is uh, how uh, Firepower can take a bunch of information there, like uh, intrusion event occurred or uh, 
particular traffic there. Like all of a sudden uh, you get a bunch of traffic there. Maybe it's a DDoS attack. You can uh, start doing things to mitigate it. So a very cool feature. Uh, it's a lot to unpack though there. So if we talk about something like rapid threat containment later, uh, that will be where we show this kind of thing where uh, something on a network like uh, AMP can identify a virus and then um, it can ask uh, Firepower to go ahead and block traffic there rather than let the virus spread across your network. Yeah. And it can also talk to things like ICE and actually shut down the switch ports if there's an issue. So pretty cool feature. Anyway, that's our policies. Uh, one other thing what we should look at is the NAT policy because we're not actually going to get online if we don't have NAT. It, for, it forces all internal devices netted to the firewall address, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Or however we want to configure it. So yeah. I'll just say David, DC1. And here is, it's basically the same logic as the ESA. It's just a GUI. So we can do a manual net or an auto net. So auto net basically just means that it's going to uh, be a very simple translation. So here's where it can say, I want a single network and translate this to an interface. And then what we would do is we would say inside, outside. And if we had that David network I made, so we could just go ahead and say, if it's the David network, we're going to go ahead and add it. And we can do things like a pad if we wanted to, or we can have other options. Uh, what I like to do is I like to go manual nap. And then I want this to be dynamic. And this lets me do groups instead. So I can just go ahead and say, hey, all private IPs are going to be natted. So this is just going to let us um, be a bit more granular there and we have a bit more options. I think I wiped this out. Yeah, okay. Inside, outside. So a basic NAT rule. Uh, if you're working on any firewall, NAT is something you're going to spend a lot of time with there because you have to not only make sure your NAT is working, but you also have to make sure that you're uh, excluding NAT from your VPN tunnels because what's going to happen is... If uh, you're natting to your public IP address there, well, your VPN tunnel is probably going to be um, something else uh, and uh, your VPN is never going to hit there. So you need to exclude it from the NAT process so that uh, it hits the VPN properly. So let's jump back over to the FMC. You see how the host name is set properly? That's because of that script you had in the beginning, yeah? Yeah, the cloud net, uh, this guy here. So I should be able to log in with the password I set. Well, it's almost like it works. If I do show <laughs> network, so there is a CLI. It's just not as um, uh, flexible as uh, the ASA, and there's no, con uh, there's very minimal configuration here. And then the only thing I'm not sure about is show manager. I think I had a bug in here. No, I got it. So you can see that the FMC, this is my IP address for the FMC, and I already set a registration key. So in theory, I should be able to use So I should be able to go here and actually add a device. I forgot to actually add this, so let me just go. So basically, on the on the firewalls, um, the firepower is you. You did some basic configuration where you set an IP address and then you set the management station IP address as well, yeah, so that they could communicate. Yep. Uh, so a bit basically the bare minimum, so that I should be able to add this to the management. Yeah. All right. So what we do here is we add the device. So I added to one nine one. And I should be able to ping that. Okay. So I can ping that. Display name. So this is actually unique in the sense that the display name doesn't have to match the actual device name. So I can call this whatever I want. David DC1 FTD01. And this is just uh, informational in the FMC there, but uh, it's not going to cause me any grief here. So what I want to do is I want to tell it that we're going to group one. And then we're going to pick the rule set I made. So we're binding it to the outbound that we spent the last little bit talking about. Now, um, this is more just for licensing stuff there, but uh, you tell it, uh, in the newer versions, you tell it which um, FTD version you're running. And basically it's based on the resources there. So if you um, need like a 10 gig firewall, you 
uh, pick more of this rather than the uh, lower ones, but uh, this is good enough for us. Uh, we want malware. We're just going to check all the buttons. And my browser auto config added that. All right, so we should probably go register. And what this is going to do is the FMC is going to connect to the um, Firepower device and it's going to register it. And then when it's done, we can actually have a close this out by looking at some um, interface configuration. And then uh, we could push the roll, and that'll probably be the end for the t today. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to take in, isn't there? There's a this is, and we're only scratching the surface, I assume. Oh yeah, yeah. There's uh, tons to this. There, I mean, uh, they even have a scripting engine uh, built into this there. So for features that aren't added to Firepower yet, you can um, script them out using ASA configuration. There's how all many, kinds of crazy bells and whistles. If I went on a full time course, how many days do you think it would take me to get a like a foundational knowledge? Is it a five day course or something? I'd say a basic uh, basic would be a week course, and then yeah. uh, advanced. Uh, you could probably get another week course out of it. So we can see here that it's uh, adding the firewall. You can detect that it's uh, KVM. Um, if I added like a an Azure box or a physical box, this would uh, reflect the proper model number. So what we'll do to keep things moving along is I will add the other guy. And what we'll do is we'll build the basic configuration in the cluster, and then we'll push some roles, and that should be pretty good for a wrap-up. But yeah, uh, like um, the beta is just ending for 7.1. So like uh, uh, there's actually a really good tie-in to what we did last time with Ansible because they added uh, that dynamics, uh, dynamic attribute connector. And it basically runs on a server there and pulls like your Office 365 IPs dynamically for you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely come a long way, that's for sure. So let's reality check. Let me ask you some reality check questions. Cisco have for a long time been pushing this thing that automation, 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 and gooey, gooey, gooey. Um, which is a big change from you know the old days when you and I started. In reality, what do you, what is your opinion on that? Is is that is that what people should learn? Well, the saying I always say, and I probably said it to you uh, in one of our other conversations, is that uh, it's less important to know how to automate things than it is to know what you're automating. I mean, automating can be a real time saver. It can also be a very dangerous thing because if uh, if you look at, say, Amazon, every outage they ever had is uh, due to automation or the recent Facebook issue uh, was also caused by automation. So it's uh, uh, automation can be a good thing there, but it uh, doesn't replace the fact that you actually need to understand like all those features I'm talking about when we're going there. You need to understand what is what. Uh, I have plenty of firepower scripts, as you might imagine, yeah. and uh, I do things there for uh, adding objects and um, making my life easier. But um, typically, uh, I like to have a hard limit there. So if you tell me to add 10 firewall objects, I'm probably just going to add firewall objects by clicking the objects button and adding them here. Uh, if you tell me to add 100 objects, I'm probably going to say, OK, I'm going to script something. I'm by the hour, but uh, not that by the hour. <laughs> Yes, I mean, you, you you saying what everyone I talk to says, and that's learn learn the fundamentals, learn how things work. Don't think that automation or these abstraction type products are going to take you away from a fundamental fundamental understanding of how things actually work. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, the reality is, I mean, Python's fun. We all love Python, but uh, it's really not that complicated. To uh, I mean, I could show you. Uh, I mean, right now we can hammer out a Python script that will push like a router change in probably five ten minutes. Well, uh, with uh, explaining what we're doing and stuff, it's not difficult. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, we're just pushing a bunch of commands there. And if you don't know what those commands are putting in, that's where the real risk is, right? So that, that first firewall has been added, is that right? Yep. Like, for example, before Cisco added the um, secure dynamics attribute connector, I did this myself. So what I would do is I would uh, pull stuff from Office 365 and I would push that to um, the uh, firewall. Typically, the thing about automation is wait till you have something to automate because uh, for one, you need a goal for to keep you focused and actually solve a problem there. If you just want to learn it just for fun, you're just going to forget in a month if you make a subnet calculator and then never touch it again. But yeah, always learn your fundamentals because at the end of the day, if I hire you for uh, as a network job or a security job, uh, and you know Python, I'm hiring you because you're a solid, well, I don't really hire juniors, but uh, uh, if uh, I wanted to 
saw, saw a networking junior. I'm looking at, are you a CCNA and whatnot there? I'm not looking at, uh, are you, uh, can you Python things there? Because at the end of the day, you either know how OSPF works or you don't, and that's going to make the difference, right? Anyway, this is added. So we can finally click on this. So what we can see here is, we'll start from left to right. One thing I probably will automatically automate is um, uh, like adding a bunch of objects into uh, FMC. But uh, honestly, I'll, I'm more inclined just to use Postman than to um, uh, than to write a Python script because uh, really it's just sometimes easier just to edit the JSON and enter it, hammer out the names rather than use the web interface. So anyway, in here we have our firewalls and there's a bunch of options here so we can change the name and stuff if we want to. Uh, one cool feature is I can push this configuration onto um, other firewalls. So if I wanted to, I could uh, make a template with all the IP addresses and all the routing and stuff I need. And then I can go ahead and use this to push to other devices. So if I wanted to, I could push all the configuration onto the new one there, and that's just going to save me a lot of time in doing the configuration. So that's a really handy feature. You can also, there's a bunch of advanced features here that we can talk about one of these days here, like, uh, are we going to automatically roll back the configuration if connectivity fails? If you uh, put like a block all uh, access list accidentally there, this is going to uh, roll uh, save you after 20 minutes. Yeah, time zone stuff, uh, licensing, um, the uh, VPN client, uh, you need to enable separately. It's, um, don't know why they don't give you the checkbox, to be honest. And then uh, you can change the management interface if you want to, but typically I don't find a good reason to do that. Uh, I will do interface first. So we'll do the interfaces. And that's pretty much what you'd expect. So what we can do is go ahead and give this a name. And this is all largely the same logic as an ASA. So you give interfaces names and that's how they're referenced in configuration. And uh, we also want a security zone. So I already have a security zone that's defined because this is an existing lab, but this is just any name I want. When we, if you remember our rule set I did inside to outside. So what I'm basically saying is this is the outside interface. And then um, when I do the gig one, that's going to be the inside address. So we'll just give this an IP address. We'll just say 0, 1, 2, 3, 11. So that is basically our first interface. We can do our second interface, and that's all we'll do. By the way, this does support VRFs, David. Yeah. So uh, yeah. you can have separate routing tables and stuff that suits you. All right, so enabled. Uh, mode, if you want to do things like ER span or whatnot, you can uh, definitely do that. Uh, I don't find a huge reason to do that for aside from troubleshooting, but you can. Uh, inside, oh, we're just going to say this is 10, 101, 10, uh, You can do IP version 6 if you want. Um, it's pretty mixed in terms of the adoption these days, but uh, it's there if you want it. Uh, you can change MAC addresses if you need to. You can mess with how our ARP is set up. Uh, duplex settings, you typically don't need to mess with it, but you can. And if you wanted to change uh, the management interface, you can. Uh, in a new release, they're re-architecting how they're doing the management interface to get rid of that diagnostic. So uh, that might go away over time, but uh, that's how it looks today. So we'll just go OK here. And we're just going to go ahead and hit Save. We can also do things like if you want to do an inline set, which is um, if you want to have um, the two switches uh, act like a, v a virtual wire in Paul Alter terms, you can uh, basically have it so that it goes in one end and out the other as a layer two interface. Uh, DHP server, if you can do that if you want to push um, DHP on your firewall. Uh, usually, if you're using Firepower, you don't need to do that. But if you have a small branch, it might be worthwhile doing it. Routing. We can define virtual uh, router running tables uh, called VRFs. Uh, we don't need to do that today, but what we're going to do is we're going to add some static routes. And we're just going to say that the outside interface for any network is going to go to, let's just say, about one. And we have a static route set. So if we have a working internet, it will run out that way. And then if we go to OSPF, we're going to enable OSPF. By the way, I've been bugging Cisco for uh, quite a while now. You see OSPF, you see RIP, you see BGP. Uh, do you see a routing protocol that Cisco might have a vested interest in including here? 
EIGLP? Yep. So it actually is supported, but it's not in the GUI. You have to do it in a workaround way. I've been bugging uh-huh. them for ages there to give me an EIGLP button. And if the beta team is listening to this uh, interview, do it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, we'll do OSPF. Um, so basically, you can choose what kind of router it is. So if you want to, don't want to deal with external and um, any of that there, you can do ABR and ESR. But looking at this, you can see what I mean about automation there. Like uh, even enabling OSPF, you need to be able to know what an ABR is or an ASBR. Uh, you can see how if you're just someone who's uh, taking some uh, code they got on the website and pushing it to their organization, that can lead to some bad stuff. So we can have router IDs automatic. So a lot of the stuff is the same defaults that you would expect, but you can do things like uh, log the adjacency settings. You can push the default route. You can change the uh, administrative distance. So uh, basically most of the routing features you would expect from Cisco are here. You can do redistribution. Uh, we're going to go ahead and create an area. The default area you can see is one, not zero. So you typically want to change that for a simple lab. I was just going to say, are you doing this because you want routing between this and the other uh, firewalls, or is this just to allow you to route to routers in your network? Well, if you remember our topology, we have our Cisco switch here. Yep. So we can run, uh, when we get further along in our subsequent videos, we'll turn on OSPF, and then um, uh, we can do uh, their three routing, just for the fun of it. Uh, here we can enable the network. So I can just go ahead and say I want to enable the individual groups or I can or the individual networks or the group. We'll just go ahead and add it. And that's good enough for me. I'll go save. So we can also do things like uh, multicast routing. We can do BGP policy-based routing is something they just added. And uh, e- uh, ECMP is a important thing for uh, firewalls because um, they don't like asymmetric traffic. So if all that said, I should be able to push this policy, go deployment, and our new one is, oh, actually they're doing the initial deployment first, so we'll come back to that in a minute. So Donald, lots of stuff here. What's the sort of route? You have to do CCNA first, I would say. And is that right? And or what would you recommend someone study before they get to this? Yeah, well, I'd recommend you be a CCNA before you do anything Anything more advanced than the CCNA, I guess, is a better way to put it. Like, uh, you can technically go straight to the CCMP if you want to there, but uh, that's almost guaranteed failure unless you have the foundation that the CCNA uh, gives you. I mean, because uh, even the CCNA, like, will teach you, like, okay, the basics of uh, OSPF and uh, IP management and ACL. So at least you have the basic logic of where it's coming from. It won't uh, be a direct correlation there, but it'd be a lot better than nothing. Beyond that, it's really just getting uh, lab experience or uh, taking courses like Todd Lamley and I um, have our, our books out. I'd recommend reading that uh, to get a pretty good overview of um, Firepower from the beginning. Uh, there's also um, there's also a bunch of courses on Lamley.com uh, that uh, Todd has that he covers uh, Firepower even more than I do sometimes there because uh, he used to cover it back from the uh, old source fire days. Yeah, but uh, this kind of stuff there is definitely you want to get your hands on. Um, there's different ways you can do it there. Like uh, DevNet has some um, firepower uh, racks that you can rent out. CCIE trainers like INE, they uh, have CCIE racks for security. Uh, and uh, you don't need uh, to be a CCA candidate to use that. You just need to uh, rent uh, rent it with the tokens and then you can mess around with it there and then, uh, you can get some experience that way to at least figure things out there. If you're able to get an image or a lab at work, then that's the uh, best way to do it. I wouldn't recommend just diving into firepower because this looks cool and you're not actually working because it's probably not going to get you a job um, on its own there because usually they'll, uh, they'll either treat you as a junior and they won't expect you to know it or it's a more senior position and they won't give it to you because you don't have the foundation for it. So uh, yeah, just uh, the thing is just as long as you're always labbing things and chipping away at it there, like uh, it takes a long way to get to like where you and I are there where we uh, do this so much there. We don't need to think about, uh, you know, what's the mask for this or uh, yeah. what's an area like uh, you, you want to uh, get it more into like a muscle memory kind of thing. Okay. So now we can push the configuration. So what we want to do is select our David firewall. So I can search if we need to, but I can see David here and David here. So if I expand this, we can see that it's applying uh, interface policies, it's adding the OSPF and whatnot. We can 
get really granular about what's actually being added. And uh, we can see like, okay, what exactly are you doing? And um, yeah, we'll give you an assessment there. Like, is this disruptive? Is this not uh, to the traffic? And uh, it'll basically let you make a decent decision. So we're just gonna go ahead and press the deploy button. If I want to, I can estimate the deployment time uh, because my lab is running a bit slow, it's probably gonna be a couple minutes. Uh, we'll hit the deploy button. And I can give notes if I want to. Having fun with David. And go deploy. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna compile all the changes. So we can see here, there's a warning that, uh, so uh, basically because I've applied the identity policy there, it's basically saying that it's not gonna match anything. That's fine, we don't care. We're just gonna go to play. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna go ahead and push this configuration here. And then when it's ready, the last thing we can do is just show you how to get the cluster up and we can uh, carry on the next day. It's really impressive. I mean, it, it, there's a lot here. And what, what we've done thus far, it doesn't look like a lot, but it's, tell me, Donald, there is a lot of stuff happening in the background. Like we've pulled in a lot of like, pre-built rules and stuff, is that right? Yeah, well, the biggest thing that uh, time saver is that like I already had all these policies except for the one we made to go there. So we didn't have to make the IPS policy or the uh, there. So there's a lot of time saving there. I already made the hierarchy. I already made the hierarchy uh, so that uh, all this stuff was already more or less in place there. So we didn't have to worry about building the structure. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff already pre-made. Uh, objects, um, they already give you a fair amount of objects there, but uh, we can, uh, we would might have, in a proper deployment, we would have to make these through some means, either manually, which is I'll go add network and I would add the objects I need to add, or I would do um, uh, some kind of automation to get them in there, or I would use the dynamic attributes, which is a new feature. But it, even just clicking for all the pages there, you can see there's quite a lot of options here. It's going to take, I mean, if we were to just talk about every little option here, we'd be here for quite a while. Yeah. And yeah. we've already been talking for a bit. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's a big, a big product. But pretty much everything you expect there, you got your route maps, you got your prefix lists, you got your uh, uh, traditional ACLs for when that makes sense. You can do BGP stuff like uh, community lists. You can make an AS path. Like um, there's, a, we haven't even talked about or looked at VPN. So you can do things like QoS uh, platform settings. I'll show you real quick, but this is where you can have common um, uh, device settings uh, so that you can have things like uh, your syslog and stuff and your time zones and uh, your banners and stuff apply to your devices. Uh, yeah, tons of options. It'll take quite a while. There's upgrades. So you can do packet tracers still so that we can figure out what's going on. So uh, definitely it uh, can be a little bit overwhelming. So that's why I say like, you know, just try and focus on simple labs when you're trying to get into it. And um, remember that room wasn't built in a day. You got to chip away at it. This is pushed. Okay. So that's pushed. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show you, David, is uh, the best practice is to always run uh, a pair of firewalls and fail over there so that you can do things like upgrades and reboots while causing an outage. And also just if one blows up randomly that uh, you don't need to worry. And one thing I'll say about Cisco there is uh, their uh, failover for the ASA and the FTD is pretty close to bulletproof there. It's uh, I have no qualms just randomly shutting off a firewall during the day kind of thing for a big customer because uh, it's one of those like, absurdly reliable things that uh, typically works. Now, I mean, I wouldn't recommend doing it if you're, you know, employ happily employed and you uh, just want to, hey, there's a guy on the internet, I should unplug my firewall. But, you know, if you <laughs> find yourself in that situation, I find it works pretty well. So what we can do is pick the primary and then the secondary. And what happens here is the primary is the one we configure with the interfaces. And it's going to basically push the configurations of the second one there and wipe everything out. So you do want to make sure you don't get this backwards or you'll push your empty config over. I definitely didn't do that once before. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to do is we need to tell it the interfaces. And if you remember, I picked the last two interfaces. You can use the same interface for one there, but it's best practice to use one for the uh, high availability link, one for the state. 
uh, because it's going to, every time you like open up a web browser or a session, it's going to replicate that there. And if you have a busy network, it's typically a good idea not to contest that link. So uh, if you, you usually end up having two spare interfaces on the firewall, unless you're doing like a, like a router on the stick kind of thing there, you're always typically going to have um, at least some spare. But if you have only one, you can choose just the same interface option, but what are used to. Anyway, we'll give it a name. Well, it's called HA link is what I like to call it. And I like to just do an out of the way subnet because this is basically just going to be hidden. It's not going to be anywhere else on the network, but uh, you should try and keep a separate range. And then I like to get this a slash 30. Uh, it's entirely up to you. Uh, you should enable IPsec there. So it basically makes it a VPN link just in case someone somehow uh, puts a tap on it there. You don't need to worry about your uh, state link information getting captured. And then I like to just do the next subnet. So this will be five and six. Now you can use IP version six if you want to. Uh, dealer's choice doesn't really matter. So let's go add. The real world question, how much IPv6 are you doing these days? Or is it still a lot of mainly IPv4? Uh, mainly IP version four. Uh, there's uh, still a bunch of, um, people are usually doing IP version six for uplinks there. So like uh, they're, they'll do IP version six peering and whatnot, so they're not left out. But um, uh, otherwise it'll be in bits and pieces of the network there, but you don't really see it in the LAN too much. It's one of those things there where it's just going to keep carrying on until Microsoft decides in like Windows 12 that, uh, <laughs> by the way, it's hyper version 6 only or uh, that kind of thing. It's going to take that kind of thing to push it there because no one wants to make the move. And yeah. Microsoft, for all their faults, is usually not shy about um, causing an issue. If you remember Vista and all those other things there where yep. they're... Yep. Besides that, oh, by the way... Um, User account control, that's uh, here to stay now. So have fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> so what you just did there is you, you deployed IP addresses to the first firewall, if I remember. And then you you basically just set up a f uh, the cluster. You didn't do a lot on the second firewall, is that right? Or did I miss yeah, it? Yeah, I did nothing on the far, uh, second firewall. We didn't even yeah. look at it. So what's going to happen is uh, it's going to create uh, a cluster object in a minute. And then um, from that point on, uh, we only really touch the secondary one if we need to do some device specific stuff, but otherwise we um, uh, would just do everything on the um, primary. It's interesting because you, I mean, you, you you hardly touch the boxes. You just did some basic IP addressing and now everything's done through this. It's it's all, you you abstracted entirely from the device. Yeah, it's uh, it's very similar to Checkpoint if you ever yeah. talk about, or we ever do a stream on that. It's the uh, same kind of idea there where you have your firewall and then you have, uh, in Checkpoint, they have their router, uh, OS called Gaia, and it um, uh, basically they fully abstract the networking uh, from um, the checkpoint. This is kind of like a middle ground there where everything is managed, but you also control the networking. So it's uh, a little bit easier because the checkpoint can be a real pain when the um, uh, networking operating system gets out of sync with the firewall operating system. But uh, that's for another day to rent. So, so while we're waiting for it to deploy, what have we done? We basically set up a brand new cluster of firewalls, yeah? Yeah, so, so far what we've done is we created a cluster. So this is called a failover cluster. And what it does is uh, the uh, primary is actively syncing stuff to the secondary. And then um, if the event of the uh, primary goes offline for any reason, the um, the IP addresses get instantly moved to the um, the secondary and it takes over. Uh, so uh, there's no uh, delay or very minimal delay of that. Uh, there is another methodology called clustering, which is where you have like say 10 different or eight different uh, firewalls uh, running in one thing there. And you would do that to get more performance and uh, uh, more resiliency uh, because you can basically cluster a bunch of firewalls and have them act as one. That is hardware only right now, but they're working on making it virtual. So uh, when we they roll that out, I can show you what that looks like. Right now, it's ASA only for uh, virtualization. Otherwise, you need to buy the um, Firepower 4100s, uh, which is the uh, bigger firewalls, or you need to buy the really big firewalls, which is the Firepower 9K. And that's like uh, that's the kind of firewall where you can spend a million dollars on because it's a uh, you know, you, you, that's the firewall you plug in your data center and run everything through it. So for the real world, would you recommend ASAs or or um... 
fly powers. There's no real reason to sell ASA or sell. Uh, there's no real reason to um, go forward with ASAs anymore. Uh, we have feature parity for the most part. Uh, there's only a couple of things that aren't in firepower these days. And in fact, uh, firepower is starting to overtake the ASA. So that like, for example, firepower has uh, VRFs and ASA doesn't. So they're putting less development effort into the ASA itself. And uh, they were adding things like VXLAN and stuff into Firepower so that uh, every release, Firepower is getting stronger and the ASA is just basically staying the same. If you just need a basic network firewall and you don't really care and you just want a VPN and you're comfortable with it, sure. But for the most part, Firepower is the way to go there because really it's kind of, I'll, I'll use the word negligent. It's kind of negligent to uh, rely on a legacy firewall, I guess we'll call it, uh, to be... Uh, your perimeter security and nothing else there. Like you, you definitely need some kind of inspection these days. Like uh, uh, if you're not doing next gen firewalls and uh, you're not really protecting much aside from the bare basics. Yeah, things have got too complicated now. Yeah, it's uh, well, it's, uh, it's too complicated. And two, it's just um, if it was like the old days there where like HTTP was just HTTP and you know that's that. But uh, nowadays, like HTTP is its own. TCP st- uh, IP stack at the end of the day. Like it's a, if I say it's an HTTP application, your next question is like, okay, what's that mean? It can be anything, right? So, yeah, no, exactly. So, I just want to open this up to the audience. If you're watching this, do you enjoy these types of videos? And what would you like to see? Donald, you you mentioned something offline. You certified to train a whole bunch of like Cisco security stuff. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So, I'm what they call um, a fire jumper, which basically means it's a, uh, pre-sale certification for consultants, uh, Cisco partners. Basically shows that I know how the security stuff fits together and I know how to uh, basically do these kind of demos there for customers and uh, do the sales pitch. And uh, it also goes into more of the uh, competitive uh, kind of uh, discussions. So we can, uh, you know, a vendor might say, uh, hey, uh, why not Sonic Wall? And after I stop laughing, I can... Um, <laughs> Offer a rebuttal, but uh, so yeah. So uh, basically, uh, like this is my day job. There is I present uh, a lot of the stuff to sell uh, to the clients, and then after they buy it, then it's my job to actually make it work. So we, I mean, I think the question to, for the audience is, what do you want to see? So um, Donald, mention some of the products that you think we could talk about. Well, um, I think one of the cool things to do is we could work towards uh, rapid threat containment. So this is firepower, a uh, very basic level. Uh, but we could uh, take the uh, we could either go deeper into it and talk about like VPNs and stuff, or we can change the topic to like uh, Cisco ICE, which is the yeah. 802.1x platform. So we can uh, make sure that uh, if uh, I'm not authenticated on my network, you can't just plug into a switchboard and get online or on my wireless. We can, that's a topic I spend a lot of time on. And uh, we can talk about AMP, which is their. Um, antivirus, anti-malware solution, which has a lot of neat features. Um, we can talk about um, doing cloud deployments there. So we can um, talk about uh, what it looks like in this uh, built up in a lab uh, inside the cloud. We can talk about StealthWatch, which is uh, using NetFlow to uh, protect your east and west traffic, because usually you put your firewall in the where your internet is, uh, and then your LAN or your data center is usually unprotected because uh, it doesn't make sense to put a firewall in between. So what you can do is you can use NetFlow to uh, send the traffic to what's called Stealth Watch or this change it to, um, uh, what did they change the name? I hate the name changes. Uh, Stealth Secure Workload, I think it is. Uh, But anyway, uh, whatever they're calling it these days, uh, Stealth Watch is, um, uh, we'll look at that NetFlow traffic and identify, okay, you have uh, data exfiltration or this kind of thing there. And then it can use ice uh, or firepower to lock that traffic down. There's a lot of stuff in the security framework that is interesting. We can also talk about more abstract stuff like email security, web security. Uh, I'm game for pretty much any kind of conversation. Or if you get bored of Cisco, we can jump aisles and talk about something else. Uh, I'll never shut up if you let me. <laughs> yes, I think for everyone who's watching, please let us know in the comments what you want to what, what you want me to talk about with Donald. You know, He's got a lot of real world experience and that's what I really like. He's doing this day in, day out. What 
would you like to learn from someone who's deploying this stuff, not just someone who's you know reading it from a book, like real world stuff? What would you like him to talk about? So please make sure you put that put that in the comments below. Okay, Donald. So are we? Is this deployed now? This is uh, this is the cluster created, and the last thing we'll show you before we wrap up is um, we can see that uh, we have the primary IPs, but we need to add a standby IP, and this is how the failover works. So the secondary node can have an IP address for doing this validation testing. And then what happens if there's a failure is that the active IP gets pushed to the um, standby unit instantly and it does a gratuitous ARP to uh, update everything. And then after that, uh, all traffic flows through the other firewall until the other one comes back up and then just switches back and forth. So all we need to do is we just need to say that, hey, this is gonna be uh, in the same subnet. And this is gonna be in the same subnet. Now, if I don't want this interface be, uh, to trigger a failover, like if it's a temporary link that we only plug in sometimes, we can choose to not monitor it, but we're just gonna monitor it. And with that, all we do is save and push this one more time, and that is our cluster up and running, so. If you go back to your diagram, uh, yeah. what we've done basically is we've, we've configured uh, DC1, yeah? And you would just do something very similar on DC2. Yeah, uh, DC2, uh, we haven't done anything yet. Um, I like to build laps and just in case I need them, but sometimes a lot is left on the cutting room floor. But basically what I would do is I would push the configuration over to these guys there and I'll just modify the IPs a bit. And if we pick this up next time for like VPNs or something, then uh, they would just be ready to go. Yeah, so literally you'll just like, uh, you copy the config from... DC1 to DC2 and, and change the IPs and, you, and you're done. Yep. That's really cool. And then just a final point is if I wanted to, you can see there's a health warning there. It's basically saying, hey, the uh, public interface isn't uh, receiving any IP address or any packets. And just because we haven't actually configured anything there, so there's nothing to send packets to it. But yeah. you can see it's a bunch of health monitoring already. And uh, that's not just cluster specific. That's uh, for everything there. But you can modify what generates and what doesn't. If I wanted to, I could go ahead and I could switch the active peer. So I was going to instantly push the IP addresses over to the other one there. I could revert. Uh, uh, so we, uh, we can break the cluster if we need to. So uh, you can do all kinds of fun stuff uh, now that it's clustered. And it just gives you a good peace of mind as uh, best practice here. You typically don't want to have a single point of failure in anything in IT. So you typically always want to Whatever it is, you should have a pair of firewalls. Uh, unless it's like a branch or something, you don't really care if it goes offline. So what, how's it, does it work well for upgrading? So if you have to upgrade the firewalls, do you find the clustering works well for that? Oh, it's perfect. Um, I've almost never had an issue because uh, basically what it does is it does one. Yeah, it fails. It does one, and then when it's ready to reboot, it just the uh, it switches over, and then it does the other one, and then it uh, switches back. So Donald, I really want to thank you. You know, this has been a long sort of introduction, but it's it's still just an introduction to Firepower. Really want to thank you for, you know, spending all this time sharing your knowledge with all of us. No Thanks, worries. man. And uh, right. yeah, look forward to having you back, man. Cheers. Sounds good. Let me know what the poll says. Yeah, we'll do. Cheers, man.